Welcome to Bird Ultrasound. My name is Stephen Bird and I'm a sonographer living in Adelaide in South Australia. I've produced this website containing a wide variety of my ultrasound lectures, live scanning demonstrations, tips and tricks, etc. on a broad range of ultrasound topics. Everything from vascular ultrasound to obs and gynae, head and neck ultrasound, musculoskeletal, etc. So there's truly something for everybody. I've put together this compilation webinar which contains some musculoskeletal, gynaecology, breast and scrotal ultrasound material. These are just examples of what the material is like on the website and if you enjoy these you can subscribe to the website and enjoy the full versions of these presentations as well as of course many more presentations on a wide variety of topics. With the subscription you'll receive 12 months of unlimited access to all the material on the website. Everything you enjoy will generate a CPD certificate, making your compliance with your CPD program easier. Many of the presentations also contain downloadable notes which you can keep forever, and you can keep these in your workplace as a quick reference. Happy scanning, and I hope you enjoy the material. I think the title says it all. The elbow is one of my favourite joints for assessment with ultrasound, and the reason it's so good for ultrasound is because we do have this wonderful 360 degree access to the joint. Nothing's too deep, we don't have adiposity as a problem. Everything is just perfect for ultrasound and all of this, nearly all of the significant pathologies that can create elbow pain, we can see nicely with ultrasound. The first thing I like to do when I assess any uh, articulation is to ask the articulation itself if it has an effusion to try and determine if there's any intra-articular cause of the patient's pain. So with the elbow I start with the coronoid recess. So the coronoid recess is just on the medial side of the distal humerus and, and when you look at the coronoid recess you can see there is a small amount of physiological fluid here on this video and then uh, this is the brachialis muscle in front of it and this is the anterior fat pad here this fat pad is extra articular and sits just on the surface of the joint capsule there. So this is a normal physiological amount of fluid. If you contrast that to this patient, you can see that there's now a larger amount of fluid and this is a pathological joint effusion. And that extra articular fat pad has been displaced anteriorly and superiorly here, causing a, this sonographic version of the anterior sail sign uh, from a lateral radiograph of the elbow. If you look at this patient, this one is different again because this one has a cloudy appearing joint effusion and this is a hemarthrosis. So in this patient the, there must be some significant intra-articular derangement and in particular it's quite likely you're going to find a fracture. So in this patient I'll be going to the uh, radial head and neck and having a look to see if I can find a fracture in that articulation as they're very common. You don't have to limit yourself to just the coronoid recess. Uh, I've now come to the, the front of the elbow joint and I'm scanning on the radial side, so distal humerus and then onto the radial head and neck. And this is the annular recess and you can see the way that the effusion comes down over the top of the radial head onto the radial neck. And then you can also come around the back of the elbow joint and this is also a nice sensitive spot to have a look for a joint effusion. So this is the triceps apparatus here, the triceps tendon insertion. Um, this is the uh, olecranon recess of the elbow joint uh, itself and you can see there's a significant effusion and what looks like a lot of synovitis, so synovial proliferation. Quite likely this is going to be a rheumatoid patient with this type of ultrasound appearance. When you're having a look for uh, at these joint spaces, you can also occasionally see loose bodies. And if it's an elderly patient or more elderly patient with osteoarthritis, then these loose bodies will be associated with that osteoarthritic process. If it's a younger patient, you can consider the concept of synovial osteochondromatosis as an alternative diagnosis. But just make sure that when you're looking at uh, for a joint effusion, you're also looking for loose bodies. And also, when you're looking for loose bodies, also consider that you might see some synovitis. So once you see a joint effusion or what looks like a bit of thickening of the joint capsule, um, test this with your colour Doppler and, and see if you've got some hyperemia. So in this case, I'm using SMI and you can see that there's quite a lot of vascularity of this joint capsule. So this patient has synovitis, not just a simple joint effusion. And again, this makes me think about whether or not the patient has a rheumatoid condition.
Certainly that this is an explanation for the patient's pain. And when I ask this patient to put a single finger on where their pain is in the elbow, they usually frustrate you by sort of drawing a line right around that 360 degree circumference of the elbow. And that's because they can't localize the pain because it's coming from the whole of the joint capsule. So it's an intra-articular problem. And, and that's why they have a poor localization on clinical um, questioning. The most common thing that we are asked to look at in the elbow is, of course, tennis elbow. So this is tendinosis of the common extensor origin, and in particular, it's the extensor carpi radialis brevis uh, tendon origin that is uh, tendinopathic. So we need to be able to localise the extensor carpi radialis brevis component to best diagnose tennis elbow patients. This is the way I set my patient up. I have them sitting opposite me, uh, in a, so both sitting in chairs using the bed between us. I have the patient with their elbow flexed at 90 degrees and their thumb pointing towards the roof. And I place the, the uh, proximal end of the transducer on the lateral epicondyle and I point the distal end of the transducer roughly towards compartment two of the wrist here. So, so just uh, slightly to the radial side of Lister's tubicle because that's going to line you up with that uh, compartment two apparatus. And the resultant image is this where we see the lateral epicondyle we see the radial head, we can see this deep layer of collagen, so all of this collagen here. This is all the joint capsules, so this is radial collateral ligament and annular ligament of the elbow articulation. The superficial fibres from here to here uh, have their own little origin here, and this is the extensor digitorum communis, or extensor compartment 4 component, if you like. And between these structures, between here and here, this is what we hope is going to be extensor carpi radialis brevis. However, on this picture where we've got the radial head, and it's such an elegant, beautiful picture, this is not extensor carpi radialis brevis. It is, it is really a hybridization of the other components of the common extensor origin. So to then isolate the extensor carpi radialis brevis component, we need to do a small movement of the transducer, and this is most important. So this takes me, takes me from this image, which is reference image one, to this image, which is reference image two. So on reference image two, I've slid the transducer slightly towards the patient's shoulder and I've kept the transducer on that lateral epicondyle and I've maintained it pointing towards compartment two in the wrist. Now what happens here is the radial head just sort of almost disappears. You can almost see the ghost of the radial head left here, that's all. And when you get this position, this is 100% pure extensor carpi radialis brevis, and this is where you're going to see a pathology with your tennis elbow patients. So this picture is not a particularly attractive picture, however it is the most diagnostic picture. This is my favourite picture when you're looking for tennis elbow. The third picture, so reference image 3, is to then draw the transducer back back through the original reference image one, and then continue that movement further down until you uh, reach this position where you can really see a, a good, thick, easy place to look at the collateral ligament of the elbow. So this is the, the radial collateral ligament and annular ligament. So my reference image three is really about looking at the joint capsule, so the ligamentous apparatus of the lateral elbow joint. Once I've done um, once I've done these three pictures, you can review the benefit of them. And so this is reference image one on a particular patient, and this is reference image two on the same patient. So you can see how if I had just taken my standard uh, attractive reference image one picture, you would have missed the pathology. You can small, see a small enthesophyte here from the extensor digitorum communis origin, but the collision of, of the tennis elbow component really looks very healthy, so there's, there's no evidence of any pathology here. And then as we slide the transducer towards the shoulder for reference image two, you can see we've just got the very edge of the radial head here, just ghosting in the background. You can see this gross pathology here. We've got lots of myxoid degeneration and clefting tears of the extensor carpi radialis brevis component of the common extensor origin. And this is classic tennis elbow. So if you're just satisfied by this image, you're going to miss this pathology. You need to walk through the full thickness of it and in particular, get yourself to that uh, reference image two location to get the best uh, diagnostic result. So if we look at this video here, you can see that as we come through, it looks entirely normal here. So this correlates to this reference image one. And then as we slide the transducer towards reference image two, you can see the tear and extensive carpi radialis brevis. And this is here, which is the reference image two. So reference image one, reference image two, we're at image one at the moment and we're moving towards image two. You're starting to see the clefting and there's the pathology. And when you put the Doppler on here, you will see the hyperemia associated with the tendinosis of the uh, common extensor origin. You can also look at this same area in the short axis. So uh, 
the day that I decided to look at the common extensor origin short axis, I think was the day that I really started to understand the anatomy of the common extensor origin uh, much in much more depth. So I simply turn the transducer from reference image one 90 degrees. So go go 90 degrees there, and then slide the probe distally towards the wrist so that you come into the sort of musculotendinous junctions, if you like, of the common extensor origin apparatus. And when you do this manoeuvre, you'll see the radius here, you'll see the supinator muscle belly on top of it. This is extensor digitorum communis sitting on top here. This is extensor compartment four, and this is ex half of extensor compartment two. This is ECRB. Over here is ECRL. And ECRB makes its tendon here, very eccentrically, underneath extensor digitorum communis. And this is the area that we have to look at. So when we find this, this um, ECRB tendon, then we can follow it northwards, so head back towards the elbow articulation, up towards the humerus, and you can see it then having its origin on the common extensor, um, the, as, as part of the common extensor origin on the lateral epicondyle. So here it is here, and as we follow it proximally, we can see the anatomy beautifully. ECRB, ECRB tendon, EDC muscle over the top. This is the radial head, and now we're coming onto the lateral epicondyle, and keep following that collagen, and you can see that this is the area of derangement with these fissures and clefts and hypoechoic uh, uh, alterations through it. And you can see it's a little soft, so there's a bit of tenomalacia, and then it's hypervascular. So this is the, a really nice short axis localization of extensor carpi radialis brevis, showing this is indeed the component of the common extensor origin that is the source of the patient's pain. So if you look at this image here, it looks entirely normal. And then we move towards reference image two and it looks entirely pathological. So we go from what looks healthy when we can see the radial head, lose the radial head, get to the edge of it, and then you start to see the pathology. That's in, that's in the long axis. And then in the short axis, follow it up. Here's our tendon in the short axis of ECRB. And now we're coming over the radial head and now we're coming onto the lateral epicondyle. And you can really appreciate that the echo texture here is very abnormal hypoechoic clefts and tendinosis in the short axis, and it really is localised perfectly to the extensor carpi radialis brevis component. And then the Doppler will follow the same pattern. So you can have nice, uh, normal looking uh, collagen, and then when you come to reference image two, this is where the hyperemia will be, and you can see the, the florid hyperemia through the reference image two component, ECRB component of the common extensor origin. This is not just simple tennis elbow, this is a traumatic event and you can see here that the uh, the whole common extensor origin has now been degloved from the lateral epicondyle and in fact you can see fluid from the articulation between the radial head uh, and and the the lateral epicondyle here flowing from from the articulation and then sitting in underneath where the common extensor origin should be attached so this is a complete failure of the of the uh, elbow joint capsule apparatus so the radial collateral ligament and the common extensor origin and this is an avulsion fracture that's been pulled off of the lateral epicondyle this is a major injury to the lateral elbow so that brought me to thinking about the uh, the ligamentous anatomy uh, of the lateral elbow. So we've had a look at the at the tenonous anatomy, the extensor digitorum communis here, and and this is the uh, the, the sort of hybridised component of the common extensor origin. But this basement layer, so this line through here, everything between here and this bone, which is the radial head, and this bone, which is the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, all this thick area here is the joint capsule of the elbow. So this part here we refer to as the radial collateral ligament, and of of course, this part we refer to as the annular ligament, although it is just one continuous sheet of collagen. It just changes its name as it goes from being adjacent to the lateral epicondyle to then being adjacent to the hyaline cartilage on the radial head. So that is the thickness of the joint capsule. This is the apparatus of the of the radial collateral ligament of the elbow joint. So we can see tears of this quite commonly with patients with chronic tennis elbow conditions and also patients that have undergone trauma. So this is, a, a, this is the radial head here, and this is the lateral epicondyle. This is the, the radial collateral ligament here, and this is the annular ligament. And then as we stress this elbow, you can see the cleft just opens up. And what the clue here is that the intra-articular fluid simply flows through and creates like a Suez Canal through the middle of the cleft between the two components. So this is torn right through the middle. This is a, not the most common site for a tear. It often tears from here, so from its origin, the radial collateral ligament origin. But this is really torn from almost the junction between the radial collateral ligament and the annular ligament. But that fluid moving through that space is the clue to the diagnosis. 
So in this video here, again, you can see that same clue. You can see that the elbow joint fluid is is obtaining an abnormal position. It's coming out from between the radial head and the lateral epicondyle, and it's sitting underneath the common extensor origin. And I'm using a little bit of transducer pressure here, and if I start this next video, you can see with that transducer pressure, you can really appreciate the flow of fluid from the joint space, like, like a Suez Canal here, through into the, the space that's underneath the common extensor origin. So this is proof, if you like, it's like a, a native contrast test using the fluid itself and its compressibility and its movement to show that, that there is a connection here um, and a breach in that collateral ligament apparatus. The other clue is this bit of tissue here, and you can see this piece of tissue hanging down between the radial head and the capitellum. I refer to this as a teardrop sign, and what this is, is this is the annular ligament that is no longer tensioned up here. Because it's come away, it now sort of just droops into the articular space here, and, and that hanging piece of collagen I refer to as a teardrop sign, and that's also another good sign that the radial collateral ligament apparatus of the lateral part of the joint capsule of the elbow has failed. So this is a simple example, and you can see with the transducer pressure, I'm using that native contrast. You can see little bright spots of maybe bits of hemat maybe bits of blood product or, or proteinaceous debris. But you can see these swirling around. You can see them moving freely from the intra-articular space to this location underneath the common extensor origin. And that can only happen if the lateral elbow joint capsule, if the radial collateral ligament has failed. And this is a complete tear of that radial collateral ligament. You can tell by this schematic that uh, malaria and duct anomalies uh, are quite wide and varied and, um, and when you see a uterus uh, you notice that it's a slightly odd shape, then you have to sort of scratch your head and think, you know, what am I dealing with? Am I dealing with a bicornuate uterus, a septate uterus, a subseptate uterus, an arcuate uterus? How am I going to classify it? And this presentation is going to take you through a really simple and easy method for you to apply some very straightforward rules, and then you can classify the, the malaria and duct anomaly correctly for each of these uh, cases that you come across. And of course, remember when you see a malaria and duct anomaly, you may notice it in the uterus but you may also notice it in the renal tract. You might notice that you have a duplex kidney, a crossed fused ectopia, or a horseshoe kidney, an absent kidney, etc. So remember that the malaria duct not only affects the, uh, the uterus, the shape of the uterus body, and also the shape of the endometrial cavity, but it also affects the shape and the, the structure of the, of the renal tract and the kidneys as well. So what's the shape of the cavity of the uterus and the endometrial cavity? So the shape of the uterus and the endometrial cavity is, is very variable, and, and we see this in our day-to-day -day, uh, clinical practice. Uh, using the C-plane and really having the patient in the sort of mid to light, late part of the cycle gives you the best imaging opportunity. So it's a little different to, say, when you're looking for a polyp uh, for a dysfunctional bleeding in, in the endometrial cavity. You really want uh, the lady to present to you at about sort of day five or six, just, just sort of tapering the end of menstruation or just after the completion of menstruation. However, when you're really looking to, to assess the shape of a cavity, if that's what if that's what the scans for, I don't mind that lady coming in uh, towards the later stage of her cycle, so that she has a, a more proliferative endometrium, and it gives you a nice thick endometrium to try and assess the shape of it. And it's really important when you do your when you do your C plane acquisition that you not only get the the endometrial cavity, but you get the entire uterus on, and make sure that you get the dome of the fundus of the uterus in in your volume, because the the shape of the dome of the fundus is really pivotal to correct characterization. So perform a volume acquisition with your transducer, and the way I do that is using a transvaginal transducer. I place it in the in the sagittal plane, and then I use a wide angle uh, on my machine. So ask it to to start uh, mechanically looking out to the left and then going across to the right, so that I get both the cornua on and enough depth to make sure that I get the dome of the fundus on. So when I when I get the machine set up nicely for that, then I get a nice volume that I can reconstruct in the C plane. And as I reconstruct it, I'm going to tilt it and adjust it slightly to make sure that it's beautifully symmetrical. And then I make my measurements on that resultant image. So this is a really nice example of what I would like. I've got the, I've got the fundal dome on here. I've got really nice symmetry coming out to both the cornua and I can appreciate the shape of the, of the uterus, the myometrium and the endometrial cavity. So what measurements do we do? Well, there's a range of measurements that we can do once we have our, our reconstruction. So if you take uh, a line sort of between the two, two cornua, we call this the intercornual line. So we can put a line across there. 
And then we can have a look at the myometrial thickness. So that's, that is uh, an elevation between uh, the, the middle of the intercorneal line and the top of the fundus of the uterus. So this is the myometrial thickness. It's the thickness of the tissue above, so to the fundal side of the intercorneal line, to the very tip of the fundus of that uterus. Then we have a look at the depth of the myometrial dip, and that is from the intercorneal line back towards the cervix until you reach the endometrial cavity. So, uh, so this is called the, the depth of the myometrial dip. And then the last thing we can do is we can measure the angle of the myometrial dip. So by drawing a line down from, from the cornua straight down along the edge of the endometrial cavity, and then on the other side we can measure this angle here to see if this is an acute angle or an obtuse angle. So the measurements are really quite simple to perform once you've got your C-plane image, and, uh, and so it's quick and easy to do. So what we see with a normal uterus and a normal endometrial cavity is that we have a domed fundus and we have a relatively sort of triangular shaped uh, endometrial cavity and a, a fairly flat top to it, so a nice flat top. So a dome to the fundus of the uterus and a flat top to the normal endometrial cavity. And this is your, your regular lady, this is your standard exactly, exactly as you'd expect normal piece of anatomy. Then we start to have the variations and we can have a septate uterus or a bicorneate uterus and it's really important to work out which one of these is which because if you look at the endometrial cavity of these two uteruses they are identical so the endometrial cavity is really exactly the same the shape of the endometrial cavity but if you look at the shape of the uterus they're very different so in a septate uterus you have a round domed fundus to, to, the, to the myometrium and in a bicorneate uterus you have this V-shaped fundus where we have two, if you like, rabbit ear type, type appearances of the uterine fundus dipping down in the middle, dipping down below the intercorneal line here as opposed to the dome here. So this is a septate type of uterus and this is a bicorneate type of uterus and the way to differentiate them is not to look at the shape of the cavity but to look at the shape of the fundus of the uterus. So how do we measure and how do we interpret this? So if we look at the apex of the fundus relative to the intercorneal line, so the, the, at the fundus, the apex, um, if it's more than five millimetres above the intercorneal line, it is a septate uterus. So in other words, we draw the intercorneal line and then we measure this distance here and we are greater than five millimetres above the intercorneal line, therefore that is a septate uterus. If you measure from the fundus and it's less than five millimetres above the intercorneal line, then it's bicorneate. So for example, if you look at this one, when we measure from the intercorneal line to the, the, to the dome of the, the fundus of the uterus, then we see that this is actually a negative measurement. So, so it must be more than five millimetres. So even if this is just slightly above the intercorneal line, so say it's here, so we have an intercorneal line across and then the fundus sort of dips down like this ever so slightly and that measurement there becomes less than five millimetres, then this is still classified as a bicorneal uterus. If we have more than five millimetres above the intercorneal line, then we classify it as a septate uterus. What about arcuate versus subseptate? So with an arcuate, if you measure that intercorneal line and you have a less than 1.5 centimetre dip below that intercorneal line, then you're arcuate. And if it's greater than 1.4 centimetres dip, then you have a subseptate uterus. So you measure there and you measure there. This one is less than five millimetres, so, sorry, less than 15 millimetres, I should say. So this is an arcuate uterus, and this one is greater than 15 millimetres, so therefore, therefore this one is a subseptate uh, uterus. With arcuate and subseptate, we can also measure the angle of the dip. And with an arcuate, that angle is obtuse, so in other words, greater than 90 degrees. And with subseptate, it is acute, in other words, it is less than 90 degrees. So an obtuse angle here equals arcuate, an acute angle here equals subseptate. 
So this is an example of an arcuate uterus. So if we draw an intercorneal line across here, so we've got this line across here, and then we measure down until we reach the endometrial cavity, you can see that we have 6.67 millimetres. That is less than 15 millimetres. So this is not a subseptate. This is an arcuate uterus. Scanning the area immediately posterior to the nipple can be a challenge. Uh, the first thing is to make sure that you've got your ultrasound room nice and warm. You keep the patient warm, so with a gown on, etc., before you begin the scan, and then use warm gel. This will make sure the nipple's nice and soft and you get much better image quality. The second thing is that imaging the little ducts behind the nipple uh, require the nipple to be rolled onto its side because if you're looking straight down the line of the ducts, you're not going to get any definition. You have to need, need to have the ducts laying on their side so that we can see uh, the, the interface and, and, the, uh, and the, the contents of those ducts. So I never want to see another picture like this again. This is just someone scanning directly over the top of a nipple. It looks like there could be a massive breast cancer in there. Who would really know? And I think this is a completely inadequate technique just to directly scan over the nipple. I don't mind scanning in underneath the areola component. That's okay and shining uh, the ultrasound beam in underneath the nipple, but certainly not using that technique. This is a gel loading technique where, where the sonographers put lots of gel uh, and sort of drown the nipple, if you like, in gel and then put the transducer and, and use a bit of a standoff there. And this does give a reasonable result although I still don't think you can see the ducks using this technique so it's still not my favorite technique. If I need to uh, look at the nipple if there's a discharge or some other nipple related uh, symptoms then I use what's known as the rolled nipple technique and it was developed by the wonderful Tom Stavros. So what you do is you use this is my index finger here so I've got my index finger really on the edge of the areola margin and then using the transducer I roll the nipple over on top of my index finger that lays the nipple on the side and then you can see this beautiful ducts here you can see the walls of the ducts and if there's a papilloma here it really can't hide from me and it is wonderful definition. So it's called a rolled nipple technique, and personally, I think it's the only way to go. Now, if you're thinking that, hang on, what if the lady has a fairly flat profile nipple or even a retracted nipple? Now, obviously, if the nipple is quite proud, it's very easy to do a rolled nipple technique, but I've never met a nipple yet that I can't get a good rolled nipple technique image from. Uh, even if it's a retracted nipple, uh, if you just take a bit more tissue as you roll it, you can still see the ducts in underneath it, and that's a really good way to, to get great images uh, immediately of the ducts behind the nipple. Once you get these images, then you start to find things like this, which is a little papilloma. So you wonder, first of all, if this is a bit of impersated material sitting inside the ducts, but when you put the uh, the uh, advanced dynamic flow on it here, you can see immediately this is vascularized tissue and this is a papilloma. And here's another example of a papilloma using a rolled nipple technique and the SMI technology showing this vascularity. Papillomas are really very commonly highly vascularized as opposed to just impersated secretions, which of course are, are avascular. In this case, uh, we were hunting for some DCIS type calcifications behind the nipple and using the rolled tipple, nipple technique we can see really clearly uh, these multiple little calcifications correlating to the mammographic findings. I'm going to attempt to demonstrate to you how I perform a rolled nipple technique using this pen as my nipple as a prop. So what I do is I place my index finger about a centimetre and a half to two centimetres away from the apex of the nipple. So it sits really on, if you like, the almost the edge of the areola. Then what I do is I bring my transducer in against the side of the nipple as so, and I dig it into the, into the breast tissue, and then I roll the transducer over the top of my finger like so. And as I roll over the top of the nipple, what this means is I end up with my transducer being parallel to the ducts of the breast. This gives us really nice specular detail, a bit like if you're doing musculoskeletal work, really looking at tendon fibers. And this allows us to hunt for papillomas and other lesions, including calcifications immediately behind the nipple. This Tom Stavros technique is a game changer and will, will give you unique definition in the ducts behind the nipple that you can't achieve in any other way. This looks very similar to the papilloma that I've just shown you. However, the advanced dynamic flow in this case shows no evidence of any flow within it. This is just a little bit of impersated material, just a bit of normal secretion inside the duct. This is a breastfeeding lady, and this is scanning in the axilla. And so we, we have a palpable lump that's presented here. And this is just because of a blocked duct. So we have some, some accessory breast tissue in the axilla, and this has formed a galactosil. Let's talk about breast cancers. So there's all different types of breast cancers, and first we're going to talk about non-invasive breast cancers, which sounds like a contradiction in term, terms, but we can have ductal carcinoma in situ, so DCIS, and this is when we have a, a cancer that's forming in the breast, but it stays within the ducts of the breast. 
And then we have lobular ca carcinoma in situ. And this is where the cancer actually forms in the terminal ductal lactation units, the TDLUs of the breast, but does not invade into the breast beyond the TDLUs. So this is an example of a normal breast, and this is an example of DCIS, or if this was in fact in the lactation unit, this would be a terminal ductal lactation unit lobular carcinoma in situ, and this is what happens with invasive breast cancer. It actually breaks out of that barrier into the surrounding breast tissue. So DCIS is very difficult sonographically, and it's all about the mammogram, and it's all about calcifications. So the job of the sonographer is not to scan a breast looking necessarily for these calcifications. The calcifications will be known because we'll know about them because the radiologist will tell us that they're there on the mammogram. And then our job is to hunt that part of the breast and find the calcifications and then determine whether or not there's any mass-forming lesion or whether we have just DCIS or whether it's starting to turn into, into a more aggressive breast cancer. So you could see on that previous mammogram all those little calcifications and, and now sonographically you can see as I scan this breast here you can see the little calcifications all through all scattered through this area. So the value of being able to find these with the ultrasound is not so much that we make the diagnosis because the diagnosis is made from the mammogram but the value here is we can now perform the core biopsy using ultrasound guidance and not having to use mammograms to guide the, the interventional procedure. So these are examples of DCIS, and you can see inside the ductal pattern of this breast, you can see these little calcifications, they line up in little rows all, all throughout the ducts, you can see them lining up here, and, and this is what DCIS looks like on ultrasound, and we can then go, biopsy these very effectively. Here's another example of DCIS, you can see the little calcifications lining up in the duct here, and is it just me, or does it look like these little calcifications actually can move along the duct? They almost look like they're slightly mobile to me, and I've never seen this sort of published or talked about, but I feel like these little calcifications are actually mobile. Here's another great example of DCIS, you can see this great aggregation of little tiny calcifications on the ultrasound, and this is really perfect for us to then guide the intervention. So if you if you uh, use your ultrasound machine with the harmonics on, you can turn your dynamic range down a little bit and really look at the part of the breast that the radiologist has told you to go looking in and hunt and hunt and hunt until you find these DCIS lesions. I think it is it is certainly doable with ultrasound. So here's another example. You can see the calcifications really easily on the mammogram. And then if you look in this part of the breast here, you'll see the calcifications all sitting. You can see they're actually inside the ducts, of course, because it's ductal carcinoma in situ. And these little calcifications, we then thought we could biopsy this with confidence. We know we're getting this part of breast tissue that we're interested in, and we can make the diagnosis of DCIS. Another thing you might come across which is quite complex to, uh, to look at with ultrasound is this type of lesion called a radial scar. Now when you when you stumble upon one of these sonographically, you'll just think, wow, there's just a really big breast cancer there. It's a really easy diagnosis. But these are radial scars, and to, in truth, they're not much better to have than a breast cancer. What they are is complex sclerosing breast lesions, and they're, and they're made in a stellate-type configuration with a fibroelastic core that then entraps the ducts and lobules around it. So unfortunately, in the center of them, right in the middle, they often have some DCIS component. So they really need a core biopsy and often go on to have excision. Uh, but they do create these really mysterious looking images. The other thing with radial scars is they don't have to be after surgery. They can just appear in the breast uh, without any surgery. And you can see this area here in the breast looks quite concerning. And here on the, on, the, on the tomographic image, it looks quite concerning as well. Then when we scan it sonographically, we can see this stellate type pattern. But this proves in the end to be a radial scar. But have a look inside at these, these little calcifications. And when we core biopsy this, we'll find out that there's actually DCIS inside this lesion. Another thing that can be very tricky is a post-surgical patient where they have a scar from a previous a previous lumpectomy. And so when we scan this area, you'll see this shadowing lesion. You think, well, how, how can I be sure if this is actually just the scar or whether we have a recurrence in this area? And I think this can be really difficult. So what we need to do is serial follow-up. So we have uh, multiple... Uh, chances to have a look at the same lesion and we're looking for changes between the previous examination and the current examination. Another thing is that we can look with Doppler inside it. So use your SMI, use your advanced dynamic flow and have a look inside the scar area. And scars that are more than six months old should not have any Doppler flow. And if you have some flow inside a scar that's six months old, then this is starting to suggest that maybe we have an, uh, some recurrence and it might prompt a rebiopsy of that area. 
Then we have invasive breast cancers, and they come in different types as well. So an invasive breast cancer is a breast cancer that has spread beyond those terminal ductal lact lactation units or beyond the actual ducts of the breast into the surrounding breast tissue. So it's spilled out of the ducts, out of the TDLUs, and it's now in the surrounding breast tissue. Locally advanced breast cancers are a little worse because these ones have then spread not only out of the ducts and the TDLUs, but now they're starting to involve either the skin, the pec wall, uh, so the pec fascia of the chest wall, or they're getting into the lymph nodes up in the axilla. And then metastatic breast cancer, of course, is when it's metastasized widely into bone, liver, lungs, etc. Then we have a couple of other unusual types of breast cancer. The first one is Paget's disease of the nipple. Now, when we think of Paget's disease, we think of a bone disorder. We don't think of it as necessarily a cancer-type condition. But with Paget's of the nipple, it is a breast cancer. So it's a rare type of breast cancer where the cancer cells grow in the nipple or in the adjacent areola. And it's it, it's a ductal carcinoma that migrates up the ducts and, and from the lobules up the ducts and then involves the nipple and the skin. And the skin becomes scaly and red and, and it's often very irritated and itchy for the patients. So if a patient's uh, disease is diagnosed, there's usually an underlying DCIS and possibly an invasive breast cancer. So these ladies will, will need to be treated as a breast cancer. These, I think, are the scariest of the lot, the, the um, invasive breast cancers that are inflammatory breast cancer in nature. So these patients turn up, and, and when you look at the breast, it's often firm, it's often warm, and it looks for all the world to me like it's a lady with mastitis. And then when you scan the breast, you'll notice that there's a lot of architectural distortion and, and there's something unusual going on there. And this is really easy to make a misdiagnosis of mastitis. And we see this, unfortunately, happen from time to time, and then eventually, after antibiotics haven't helped, then we're left with a diagnosis of an inflammatory breast cancer. So what are the ultrasound characteristics we go looking for for suspicious lesions? The first thing I look for is architectural distortion. So the breast has a normal uh, horizontal architecture where things are laid out in a horizontal way. Anything that distorts this architecture is suspicious. Speculations obviously are very suspicious if, if the uh, lesion has angulated margins and speculations. A lot of breast cancers have a thin echogenic halo around it, like a desmoplastic reaction. So this is also a suspicious finding. A bit like in the thyroid, if it's tall rather than wide, then this is also suspicious. This is cutting through the layers of the breast. This is going through that normal architecture of the breast. If it has angular margins, as this one, this example here does, then this is also very suspicious. If it is hypoechoic, if it creates some shadowing, if it has any microcalcifications, and if you can see it extending into the into the ductal system immediately adjacent to it, then these are all features of a, of a breast cancer. Macrolobulation is also suspicious, particularly for the more cellular type of breast cancers. And then any, any vascularity makes it suspicious for a breast cancer as well. So let's have a look at some of these um, some of these uh, characteristics uh, one by one. So assessing for architectural distortion, we're going to see architectural distortion in breast cancers. We're also going to see it in radial scars. We're going to see it in post-operative breasts where the surgeon has cut through the tissue, creating some architectural distortion. You can see the way here that these horizontal lines have become disrupted. So you can see there's a natural line through there, through there, through there, and these have all become cut, and this breast cancer has grown up through them, and this has really distorted the natural architecture of the breast. This is an example of speculation and you can see what, the way that this breast cancer is really spreading in a star-like fashion and it's invading the tissues in a radial fashion all around itself and then you can see with the SMI how there's a lot of flow in the central nidus of this breast cancer. This is an echogenic halo, so it's what we call a desmoplastic reaction. You can see around the edge of this breast cancer, there's this echogenic rim. And you can see also there's a lot of tethering of the tissue, and there's a lot of disruption and distortion of the normal architecture of the breast here. This is really typical of a breast cancer. These are three examples of very tall lesions, so they're taller than wide, they're all hypoechoic, and these are fairly obvious uh, breast cancers. Here we have angular margins, and what I really don't like with an angular margin is when they when they reach for the transducer so they go vertically through the tissue. If you look at this example here, if you just looked at this part of this example, it doesn't look too bad, it just looks like a macrolobulated little, little area in the breast and I wouldn't have thought too much of it, hopefully just a fibroadenoma. But the moment it sent up these two periscopes that came straight up towards the transducer, then these little vertical elevations here, these angular margins that these create, this makes this highly suspicious for a breast cancer and both of these of course did prove to be breast cancers. 
If it is uh, hypoechoic, um, a lot of breast cancers are hypoechoic. In fact, it's very unusual to see an echogenic breast cancer. They can be quite isoechoic occasionally with the surrounding breast fat, but most are hypoechoic in nature. And then this is examples of shadowing. Now, these are two tiny little breast cancers next to each other. And you can see the shadowing here. In fact, because we're using my compound, you can see a shadow down through here. You can see a shadow down through here. And you can see another shadow down through here. And this is because I've got my compounding on. If you wanted to make this shadowing uh, more conspicuous, you can turn your compounding down or off and you'll just get one denser shadow behind it. So these little vertical, this, these are really tiny little breast cancers. They're sitting side by side, a little bit of vascularity in each, and both of them are causing a little bit of shadowing behind, uh, and these are typical of breast cancers. Here we have some microcalcifications, and I don't know why we call them microcalcifications. I can see them, so they're macrocalcifications. But you can see these are calcifications sitting inside this little stellate type lesion. It's hypoechoic, and you can actually see some ductal extension too. If you look at it, it's actually sticking its uh, little tentacles into this duct, and it's going to invade up the length of this duct here. You can see what it's trying to do, and it's becoming quite star shaped in its appearance. Very typical breast cancer. This one it has already invaded the ducts, and you can see the way that there's a good piece of this that's marching up this duct. Uh, I call this like an elephant trunk. It, it'll trunk up towards the nipple, and uh, and eventually will start to cause some nipple symptoms as well. You can see some calcifications in this lesion also. Macrolobulation is associated with uh, often fibroadenomas, but also with these cellular type of breast cancers. So this looks like it could be a fibroadenoma, but it is in fact actually a very cellular breast cancer, unfortunately. Vascularity inside a lesion always increases the uh, the likelihood of a malignancy. Um, and this is again that very cellular lesion. So it could be a fibroadenoma with some vessels in it. Uh, however, it's slightly angular shape, it's vertical orientation, and it's hypervascularity. Uh, of course, it was going to get biopsied and this came back as a cellular breast cancer. So this is really your classic breast cancer. It's uh, hypoechoic, hypervascular, it's got the echogenic rim, it's fairly attenuative, it's speculated, and it cuts through those horizontal tissue planes in an unruly fashion as it's uh, aggressing its way through the breast. This is a really great example of a malignant lesion and the ultrasound having perfect correlation with the mammogram. This mammogram is a tomographic mammogram and you can see that when you look at this lesion here, you can see that peripherally around it really has this speculated type pattern where it makes you feel like the actual size of the lesion and its invasive process is more extensive than the central nidus of the cancer itself. If you look at the sonogram, you can see exactly the same pattern. You can see the spicules running out through the tissue in a radial fashion here, and this is a great correlate with the mammogram. So really, I think if you look at that mammogram carefully there, I think that is the dimension of the invasive margins of this breast cancer, not just the central nidus. The challenge for us becomes with demonstrating these really tiny lesions, but really we, we comb through the breast looking for exactly the same features as I've just described. So this is a little vertical lesion that's hypoechoic. It's got quite ill-defined margins to it. It's hard to see the margins of it. And this is very suspicious of a small breast cancer. So these are the type of things we're looking for, these very, very early breast cancers buried in the glandular part of the breast. The acoustic properties in terms of shadowing of lesions does tell us something about the lesions. Now these two breast cancers have fairly aggressive shadows behind them and these tend to be low grade lesions. So they're, they're usually not vascular, they have a high fibrous content and these are not the worst type of breast cancer to have. These type of lesions are much more aggressive. So these are the, the cellular type of breast cancers and um, and you can see with this one, it's again quite speculated. It's very aggressive as it's moving through the breast. You can see there's a, a really obvious lymph node involvement as well. But look at the through transmission. It's really neutral. It almost enhances. And um, so these tend to be papillary or mucinous carcinomas. And these are more aggressive. So this is just another example of a cellular malignant breast cancer. You can see that there's a very, very good through transmission, but all the other features uh, suggest that it's a malignant lesion. And of course, it is a highly cellular malignant lesion. This one could almost um, could have almost been considered fibrocystic change with the little cystic spaces. However, uh, with the SMI, you can see the vascularity here. This is clearly a lesion, and this is a cellular breast cancer. 
this is a cellular breast cancer, again, looking uh, very speculated. And in fact, it's part of a multifocal process. So it's really important once you find a breast cancer, not to sort of just rest on your laurels, but you need to go looking for others. So in this example here, you can see I found the primary breast cancer. I found a satellite lesion, which we're scanning to now. And then as I scan further out, I scan into the axilla and you can see there's a malignant lymph node. So make sure you correlate with the mammogram. If it's a very dense mammogram, make sure once you've found one breast cancer that you go looking for others. Here's a really good example of this. So we were looking in this breast here, this area here, and this is a magnified view from the tomogram from it. And you can see the way that it's got these sort of streaky extensions. And what this is, is a small breast cancer, and it's actually infiltrating along the ducts heading towards the nipple here. So when we scan it with ultrasound, you can see that we find the primary lesion, which is here. And then as I scan, you can almost follow the ductal tissue path as I scan through. You can get all the way through until you get to the second lesion. So you can follow one lesion all the way to the second lesion. This was a concerning uh, breast cancer because it had this highly vascular pattern in the center of it. And although it was only a small breast cancer, have a look in the axilla, there's a really obvious uh, malignant node in the axilla. So what I'm doing here is I'm scanning from, from one uh, part of the lesion through the ductal pattern of the breast, and then I arrive magically at the other lesion. So there's it's multifocal cancer and you can almost follow the tissue path, the ductal pattern between them. If I start this other video, you can see here's one lesion here and you can actually see a little chain of, there's a little microcalc there, another one here, there's another one up here. So we've got this little chain of calcifications and the other lesion was just off the screen here. So we can actually tie them together. Here's another example of a different patient where, again, we've got satellite lesions. So I've literally scanned from one lesion through to the other here. So uh, it's quite often that they're sort of in the same ductal line. And so I've found one lesion here, and then I'm just scanning sort of either towards or away from the nipple along the ductal line, and I find the second lesion in the same line. They're actually connected up together. So this is multifocal malignant lesions. The next thing a breast cancer can do is start to invade not just the breast tissue around it, but in this case, the skin. So you can see this one's reached up to the dermis and you can actually see, uh, when you examine the patient clinically, you can see the skin damage that's starting to happen with the skin changes. This is a breast cancer going the other way. And you can see here, this is a very large breast cancer. And then you can see this direct extension here has actually made its way. This is the pec major muscle. And you can see it's actually sitting inside pec major um, underneath the breast itself. So it's a direct invasion of the pec fascia. Here's more examples of direct invasion. So you can see this breast cancer is tracking up through these ducts, heading up towards the nipple. This is what I call those elephant trunks that come up. And in this case over here, you can see that the, the same breast cancer, in fact, has then made its way into the lymph nodes as well. And this is a malignant looking lymph node with quite puffy cortex on, on that aspect of it. This is another example of how locally invasive breast cancer can be. You can see on these two mammograms, we've got the uh, MLO and the CC here, how there's a very obvious stellate breast cancer lesion. You can follow the tentacles of this uh, breast cancer out quite some distance, so you can see that it's locally invading deeply into the breast tissue and has quite a large radius at the periphery. You can also see the distortion that it's making to the skin line here. So when we examine this lady clinically, you're going to see some puckering of the skin and a bit of dimpling of the skin here. And this is a really uh, good sign that there's something invading going on underneath and it's these far-reaching tentacles the breast cancer is a long way from the skin but it's these far-reaching tentacles that are that are reaching out and then causing that puckering and distortion of the dermal layer on the ultrasound you can see the uh, central nidus of the cancer here and this correlates exactly to the same shape really as the breast cancer here but you can also appreciate on the ultrasound how there's this sort of tentacle like uh, spreading of the cancer through the tissue planes in all directions. So although we measure a breast cancer by measuring the central nidus of the breast cancer, you can appreciate on the ultrasound, just like the mammogram, how extensive and invasive this breast cancer is. Modern mammography also uses this uh, tomosynthesis technology, and I think this technology really shows even better again how aggressive and invasive the breast cancer is and how it follows these lines of attack through the, through the uh, breast tissue in this stellate nature in, uh, in a radial pattern around the breast cancer until it reaches the skin and starts to pucker that. And then, of course, if it's more posteriorly placed, it may reach the pec fascia 
as well and invade that as well. And again, you can see on the ultrasound how, how this really shows a, a very good correlation in terms of uh, the exact location and as well as the shape of the breast cancer, as, as well as even a couple of punctate calcifications that are apparent on, on both imaging modalities. So when we look at the ultrasound itself, you can see the uh, the, the stellate invasion going in a, in a peripheral way, circumferentially all around the breast cancer. We have a couple of little macro calcifications that sit in this area here as we scan through. And you can really appreciate uh, the far reaching and, and stellate invasive nature of this breast cancer in such a good correlation. Pediatric patients uh, with hydrocele's uh, can be a little more challenging than scanning adults, and that's because there's there's this uh, pattern of of pathology called funicular variance. So the funicular process is this it runs through the inguinal canal. So so it's it's the it's the junction between the peritoneal cavity and the uh, tunica vaginalis sort of space inside the scrotal sac. So if this has to be closed because if it was open, can you imagine being uh, an adult male? with, say, chronic liver disease and a belly full of ascites. Every time you stood up, if this if this was an open an open pathway, every time you stood up, you, you would need a wheelbarrow for your scrotum to wheel, to wheel around in front of you because you would have all of this, maybe, you know, two or three litres of peritoneal ascites, maybe more even, that would then migrate down and sit in your scrotal sac. This obviously doesn't happen, which is a good thing. And likewise, a person with a really large hydrocele you can look in Morrison's pouch, pouch of Douglas. Uh, you can look in that in that subphrenic space, and you can you can have a look in the peritoneal cavity, and you're not going to see any ascites there. And that's because these two cavities are quite separate from each other after the funicular process closes. Now, the funicular process has to be open embryologically to allow the testicle to pass from the peritoneal cavity down through the inguinal canal and then to where it finally resides in the scrotal sac. Of course, following the gubernaculum as it comes down. Once that's complete, then the funicular process becomes attritive, and that then isolates the space, potential space of the tunica vaginalis where a hydrocele can happen from the peritoneal space where ascites can, can reside. So this is a paediatric patient, and this paediatric patient has a hydrocele. So you can see it's just a classic hydrocele, but then you can, if you follow this hydrocele, you'll notice that it goes up the inguinal canal a little bit, and then it stops. And this is the attritive funicular process. So it's sort of kept going a little bit. So there's a bit of this funicular process that has sort of failed to become attritive just at the distal end here. Um, and that's why we've got this sort of large hydrocele that extends a little bit up into the inguinal canal and then stops and then won't go any further. Another variation is one that has not closed at all. So when it's open completely, uh, we don't call it an indirect inguinal hernia. If you were scanning an adult, you would call this an indirect inguinal hernia. It comes out from the peritoneal cavity, uh, it'll be fat and bowel, goes over the top of the inferior epigastric uh, artery, um, so that needs to be reversed on that slide there, and then it will come down the canal and, and come all the way down into the scrotal sac. But in a paediatric patient, we call this a patent process vaginalis, so it has a different name. And if, if, you, if you think about it, it's sort of like a communicating hydrocele where it can go all the way down. So this uh, little, little fella here has what looks like a, a, a really nice example of an indirect inguinal hernia that's coming all the way down the canal uh, and and down towards the scrotal sac, but this is just a patent process vaginalis. Another example of a patent process vaginalis, and this time it's full of fluid. So, so you can see here that the testicle uh, does not have a hydrocele around it. It's actually pinned in the corner. So there's no there's no excess fluid in this space here in the tunica vaginalis space, and that's why that testicle's pinned in the corner. What happens then is then this bit here has not become attritive, and so you can follow this fluid all the way up and all the way up through the inguinal canal and then all the way to the deep ring. So this is what we call a funicular hydrocele, where it's uh, in, that, in that funicular process component of the inguinal canal. And then you can get a, another variation where the funicular process becomes attritive at the top and attritive at the bottom, but in the middle, you've got a bit of a section there 
that, that fails to become attritive and it leaves a little cystic space. So as you come from the scrotal sac, you notice there's no hydrocele, and then you come up, up into the inguinal canal through the superficial ring, nothing to see, it all looks good. And then in the middle of the canal, you'll see some fluid, a little cystic oval shape of fluid, and then towards the deep ring, nothing, 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 and then into the peritoneal cavity. And this is called an encysted hydrocele. And you can have the same pathology in a female, and in a female, we'll call it a cyst of the canal of NUC, N-U-C-K. And you can see this is a really nice example as we're coming up through this inguinal canal. Just pretend that you're doing a musculoskeletal inguinal canal study now. You're in the short axis. There was the super, there's the superficial ring there. Now you're in the short axis of the canal. And hang on, now we've got a cyst. And now the cyst is gone. And now we're coming towards the deep ring. So it almost looks, these really look exactly like what a cord lipoma would look like in a, in a male adult inguinal canal but it's cystic, and, and that's because this is an encysted hydrocele or a canal of NUC cyst if it's a female patient. Really nice example. So another example of a sort of encysted hydrocele where the, you can just follow from the scrotum all the way up, all the way up through the inguinal canal and towards the deep ring. So and it, see again, it pushes that testicle down into the corner there. Another thing that we might see is a scrotolith. So scrotoliths will present usually as a palpable lump. So the gentleman's found a lump and they come in all sorts of weird shapes and sizes. Some of them look like uh, meteorites like this. This one looks like a dog's bone, which is quite amusing. So you see them in all sorts of weird shapes and sizes. Some look like pearls, uh, but they're scrotoliths. And, and uh, they're of no real significance. They float around between the visceral and parietal layer of the of the tunica vaginalis, so they sit in the same potential space as a hydrocele, and uh, they're really just a palpable lump. Uh, the exact etiology of where they come from, there's a few different theories, whether they start from a, a little uh, appendix testis or an appendix epididymis that gets torted and falls off, or whether they, they're just like a, a precipitation of, of, uh, of salts from inside the, the fluid that's around the around the, the testicle. This is a really typical sort of flat one. These are really common, these little flat type ones that, that sit just adjacent to the testicle. And this is again a good example of where the palpation is important because the guy knows he's got a lump and you can you might do the whole scan and not see that thing. But if you, if you, if you can get the fella to find the lump for you and then he goes, I've got it now, put his index finger on it and then put the probe right where the index finger is. So you can use the patient to do the clinical exam rather than sort of you know trying to work out where this lump is yourself. Just say, look, mate, find it for me and then I'll put the probe on the lump and then you go, okay, you've got a little scrotal if that's the answer to your puzzle. So just more examples of scrotoliths, and um, they're very, very common. And they're usually asymptomatic, just uh, the fact is the gentleman's found a lump, and that's the concern. Have you ever made this diagnosis? Thrombosis of the pampiniform plexus. When someone says they've made this diagnosis, I really worry about whether it's MSU, and, and what MSU means is making something up. So... So, you know, you've made stuff up, it's not a real diagnosis, and the thing that worries me most is that the individual has found this structure, and this is, of course, the normal vas. So they've seen lots of other vessels around, pampiniform plexus, and then they've seen one that's got an echogenic centre in it and is non-compressible. Now, the echogenic centre of the vas is the patent lumen, and you can see this vas on this side in this video clip beautifully here. And so the, the echogenic centre is the patent lumen, and the black bit around the outside is the muscle, because the job of the vas is to transport a relatively small volume of liquid, very small volume really, very rapidly at just the right time. So it needs a lot of muscle, and it needs uh, only a small lumen because the volume is small. Contrast that to a ureter, which is really exactly the same peristaltic design, but the ureter's got all day to sort of trickle the urine down into the bladder, and it needs to do a much larger volume, so it's got a big lumen and a very thin muscular wall. So that's what a vas looks like, and sometimes that can be mistaken for a thrombose vein. But this is indeed a thrombose pampiniform plexus vein, because to make this diagnosis, I need to do one thing. Find the vas and prove that I've got a normal vas, and then find the thrombus and prove that it's separate to it. If you go through that process, you won't make a mistake and you will avoid the dreaded MSU. The VASC looks quite different in a post-vasectomy patient. So in a post-vasectomy patient, the VASC looks choked up and that's exactly what it is. So it's still got the muscular wall, but now that little tiny pinprick patent lumen inside is now full of old dead sperm and that's because it can't get out and you can see the surgical clips there from where they've had their vasectomy. So so this sort of uh, worm-like appearance where you've got this black uh, tube around the outside and an echogenic centre, the echogenic centre it's like it's a dammed up 
vas. So the, the, the testicle is still producing sperm at its regular hourly rate, but it can't get out. So it sort of sits in there and eventually it just dies off and it gets reabsorbed. And there's beautiful surgical clips. So this is a normal post vasectomy appearance for a vas. If you saw this appearance in a young fella who was presenting for fertility workup, he's got an outlet abstraction and someone needs to go and have a look at his prostate and, and check that he's got two seminal vesicles and check that that vas doesn't just um, terminate and, and is partially absent because it'll be something like that going on and that's the reason that they're having uh, difficulty with their fertility. So this is normal in a post vasectomy patient. It's not normal in, the, in, in a fertility workup patient. So once you've had a vasectomy, which when you look at these video clips looks like an awful cruel snip because uh, you've got all this, all this sperm that can't get out. Occasionally you get some of these um, surgical site complications. You can see there's the normal vas because this is uh, on the other side of the vasectomy site. So that's the, the central lumen there. But then this is the, the, the vas on the testicle side of the surgical uh, cut and there is the surgical site and here we've got a lot of calcification and granulation here and that's a lump and it's a bit tender for the patient. So when I have a patient that's had a vasectomy and they've got pain I'll have a feel around see if I can feel a lump there where the pain is and then I'll put the probe on it and I'm looking for this I'm looking for some scar tissue some granulation some hypervascularity and it's usually very easy to find the vasectomy site because if you come to the tail of the epididymis and find the vas remember the vas is that big black uh, muscular walled tube with the white center, the white dot in the middle, like a donut, if you like. Uh, you follow that northwards, heading up towards the, the superficial ring, so up into the sort of groin area, and eventually you'll bump into the, to the surgical site. And you can see it here, and you can see the way that there's all that vascularity. So these are granulomas. You can see the vas here. This is on the not on the testicle side, so this is not dilated particularly here. There's, there's the granuloma there. And again, following this vas up, and then we get into this area of the surgical site, a bit of hypervascularity, a bit of tenderness, and um, and you can see there's the, there's some surgical clips and sutures here, and this is unfortunately a, a patient that's uh, going to ha has pain after their vasectomy. More examples of the same. So I think when a gentleman presents with post vasectomy pain, I think it's incumbent upon us to actually localize and and see the vasectomy site and you can see this is another really good example of of where you've got some granuloma and some inflammation that's set into that site so things do look different when you've had a vasectomy and the the expected things that you can see in the scrotum after a vasectomy is you you can expect to see that the vas is is very dilated so you can see that the vas is is uh, dilated up there and and is full of full of old sperm you can also see that the um that the epididymis, if you look on this video, the epididymis is, uh, is the little tubes are quite full and then the reti testis can also open up and dilate. So you can see that as well in, in, normal, in, a, in a post vasectomy patient that's asymptomatic. Another thing that you can see commonly in a post vasectomy patient is uh, a sperm granuloma and these occur typically in the tail of the epididymis, although not exclusively in the tail. And they occur because of extravasation of sperm. Of course, the, the testicles producing sperm has got nowhere to go. And sometimes it'll then, it'll then leak out through the little tubes. They'll, they'll leak and that causes a localized granulomatous response. And we call it a sperm granuloma. Clinically, they feel firm and tender, typically at the tail of the epididymis. Uh, this patient's got multiple of them. You can see there's sort of three little sperm granulomas that are formed. They almost like, look like little multiple endometriomas, like little chocolate cysts, but uh, full of old sperm rather than, than, than blood product. And they're, they're typically avascular in the middle. They might have a bit of vascularity around the edge of them and they can be a bit tender for the patient. I hope you've enjoyed this short snippet of my material. Please subscribe to the website and enjoy unlimited access to all of the material that I've recorded. Happy scanning and bye for now.